Professor Sivar, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. It's a little bit uh, too hot <laughs> in Bergen for my taste now, but uh, yeah, all good. It, it was the same over here. We just, uh, in the last couple of days, got some rain, so hopefully you'll get to cool, uh, cool off a little bit as well soon. <laughs> yeah, um, they say tomorrow it's going to be rain. Yeah, so, that's yeah. good, that's good. So where I want to start with is, um, because I read that you wrote the album, uh, you started writing the album in 2018, and it, it was a very fruitful uh, writing session. The songs came quickly to you. So what yes. was it about this concept of, uh, and I've, I don't know if it pronounced right, but Utgard, well, what was it about the concept of it that, that uh, made you so prolific in writing? It was a very uh, inspired uh, time, I have to say, uh, both if we take yeah, the internal part first with, um, with the concept, it came very early on mm. that uh, this was a concept I wanted to explore. I, it was just a feeling of having really delved into sort of the known concepts uh, for a while. Um, and I think E was sort of a pinnacle of that uh, with the, you know, the, the symbol being the band of, you know, the name of the band. Uh, and we have explored, had explored these rooms um, quite in depth and so on. So there was sort of a, a um, I felt some kind of magnetism towards going into something that was a little bit more unknown in a sense, you know, to write some pages on, on our own in a sense. Right. Um, also, I think from other projects that I've been working with for, for those uh, years uh, previous with uh, Anna Selvik and so on was very much oriented towards history um, and a little bit of research that we made into to making the Hugsho album, for instance. Um, so it felt natural that we wanted to go into something a little bit more uh, uncharted, you know. Mm. Um, and then the Utgard concept just sort of really just jumped on me that this this was really a uh, a different thing that I wanted to go into, and it also held so many musical artistic promises. Which is, I think, in the ba in Enslaved's backbone that we sometimes, you know, uh, it's not necessarily about breaking rules, but more about finding spaces maybe that's without rules and, and trying to write them ourselves and so on. And and again, Utgard was the perfect concept for this. Yeah, it's kind and of like oh, sorry, it's kind oh, of no. like uh, like venturing into uh, new territory in a way, and that's kind of what the concept is as well to explore certain. Uh, elements of of, um, uh, of of life of of uh your own uh personality and that kind of stuff so so what was this explore, explore, exploration like especially early on as you said it was very productive so what was this exploration for you personally like i started to find um some conceptual um uh, tools both in the mythological on the mythological side which is mm. Uh, where Grutle works, um, especially a, a lot, you know. So I talked to him and we sort of sparring there, uh, gave him input on the myth, different myths uh, regarding Utgard and so on. Um, and then also uh, my fascination for psychologist Carl Jung came into play there with his, um, you know, his, his entire concept, which is known in, in popular culture about the, the shadow uh, on a, on a person, personality or the common subconscious territories are pretty much, you know, reading about that and having Utgard at the back of your mind, it just, it's two sides of, of, two, of, a, of a strange coin, so to speak. Sure. So, so that just fueled interest a lot. Okay. How does that then translate into when you start writing? It, are those words uh, that come first then, or do you have kind of riffs and sounds in mind when you when you start thinking about this concept? Yeah, it's it's sort of a uh, both and neither. Okay. In a sense, uh, it's it's this uh, in, inexplicable thing, I guess, the idea stage, sort mm. of uh, the, the limbo where you have uh, a certain a notion or fee a feeling sort of uh, 
things hovering in your mind or, or in, in the air in front of you and, and, and sort of you can't grasp it yourself. You can't really put, put it into words directly. So you go via music. But I, yeah, it, a lot, most of the time it sort of um, splits off into one sort of process that deals with the words and the wordings and sort of yeah, trying to, to paint something with that, with the expressions and the metaphors. And, and the other hand, on the other hand, is something more abstract, which, which is the music. But I do think that this whole concept of Utgard is one thing, but also deciding that it will be sort of a journey mm. through Utgard. Uh, and also using these, that's where the artwork comes into play, I guess, that mm. also when we started working with Truls at the early stage, his emphasis on the ravens as sort of, yeah, if you want to go with psychological metaphors again, sure. Hugin and Munin translating into thought and memory. Uh, and they are sort of the only f- figures in the mythology that has sort of a constant access to this land, to Utgard. And it's a, I think it's a very interesting picture of your own psyche, so to speak. You have all these unknown uh, shadow territories, but our thoughts and, and memories are sort of the vehicles that we can explore. Sure. Uh, so that also gave sort of a musical input. I think, especially if you listen to the song Flight of Thought and Memory uh, on the album, that was really a direct sort of musical interpretation of my own image of these ravens sort of flying in over these vast territories and, and gathering the information, so to speak. Because that song in particular, it, 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 I wrote down, there, there's a lot of dynamics in that song. It kind of, the, 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 yeah, it goes from, from kind of very subtle bits and sounds to, to very harsh, uh, or harsh or hard. And uh, so, so what is it like? Do you try to resemble then a certain journey of, of kind of uh, uh, through sound in a way? I like to work like that. I can't, I don't want to, it's not even worth trying to create a one-to-one uh, mm. relationship there because it's going to be such a subjective process when the listener is going to, mm, some sure. listeners uh, associate flight with the certain tempos, others have other uh, experiences. But f- for me, yeah, I, I, I do find a lot of inspiration in, in concepts and trying to sort of soundify if if we can invent that verb here now <laughs> soundify ideas it, it's really inspiring and 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 sometimes that's what you need to sort of uh, bring out the idea in a sense and when comes the point then that you you have this concept you start working on these songs and when comes the point where you start to go to like a group and the rest of the band to kind of uh, flesh things out. So, uh, when when does the process kind of take that next step? Yeah, yeah. it's the, the first step is you know when I have the idea. Then very early on, uh, mm-hmm. like this time, it's pretty immediately after the idea uh, is put into to, okay. to words. Um, I, I I connect with Grutler because we are the we are responsible for the concepts and lyrics together. Mm-hmm. And more now than, than ever before, actually. We've, uh, on, on previous albums, there's always been sort of a 50-50 split, but we've uh, really headed towards this. Uh, instead of writing like s- such and such amount of lyrics each and so on, now it's more, I, I tend to get the idea and write down my first thoughts, but I've discovered that it, it really gets a lot richer. and. and fuller in a sense if i just pass it on to grutler when i feel i've said what i want to say and then he has full editorial mm. sort of powers over it i always tell him you know erase whatever you want uh, it would be nice if you can keep the title but uh, the rest is, is up to him normally he'll, he'll keep most of what i've done and then he'll fill it in or continue or he'll put in the start or something there's, there's just this sort of i, I guess uh, uh, bond between us that we do understand what we're trying to achieve even better when we work uh, this sort of we you jump past a few barriers when you work lyrically i think that you go more directly into ideas mm. uh, and then that's something that me and him work with all the time throughout the album and with the other guys it's pretty much when i have a demo uh, for a song 
like f fleshed out, as you say, um, um, the structure of the song. Um, the guitars will typically be quite detailed, and then there will be sort of a de uh, de escalating level of of uh, detail mm. on the rest. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll put in some simple drums just to illustrate sort of the vibe, or if I want to have it contrasted or to complement the guitar tempo and so on. But it's um, I try to to make it precise enough so that I get the point across, but also open enough and, and uh, undetailed enough so that these brilliant other musicians uh, will feel some inspiration to, to to create with their instruments on top of it. So it's sure. pretty much this, yeah. From the second, the first first song is, is ready to be presented. That's when we all start working on it together. But uh, you mentioned the other musicians, and now there, there's been some lineup changes in the last couple of years. So, so what has that done in terms of how you write with what the capabilities are of these new new people? Because, for instance, uh, Hakali, he, he does vocals, right? So, do you take that into account then in the writing? Well, oh, absolutely. Uh, that's the uh, then we go to like the external uh, inspiration for or, or the mindset of writing mm -hmm. the album. Um, now it's it's gotten quite <laughs> quite complicated and, and weird the whole like vocal vocalist situation on this album. Uh, it's kind of kind of hard to follow. So, uh, but but it's it's um, what happened is when Hamon left the band, who was uh, sort of the clean singer who also did keyboards, mm. and what we when we re uh, recruited Hawkon, uh, we saw him play with his his band doing keyboards, fantastic stage personality and all that. So we asked him if he can join on the keyboard. So it was sort of a, uh, I have to say, a bit of a scam there actually that we pulled on him because he was hired as a keyboardist and then we sort of gave him the microphone and said, and you're also the clean singer. Um, and he was like, uh, oh shit, I haven't done this before. So he worked intensively for, for um, almost a year Okay. taking vocal lessons. As it happens in his other band, Seven Impale, the singer is also a professional singer, uh, mm -hmm. operatic singer, on his spare time. Um, so they would work a lot and, and uh, unbelievably enough, like how we pulled that off is still a, still a bit of a miracle. So when we, then Kato left the band, uh, summer of 2018, it was very hectic, you know, it changed from, we did Copenhagen on a, on a Friday uh, with Kato, his last gig, uh, threw a cake in his face and said bye-bye. And then next day at Hellfest, Eva, the new drummer, was there. Okay. So it was very, like a, within 24 hours, changing drums kind of thing. Uh, and then Eva, we knew he's a super, very good producer that we've used for many years super drummer and also a very good singer. Uh, he's sung a lot of in, in rock and pop bands and even a few children's <laughs> albums, you know, it's very versatile. Um, so we thought it would be stupid not to have him also do vocals. So um, everything just blended together perfectly. Hawkon, uh, his reaction was like, that. that's awesome. Now I, now I can do what I really wanted to do and be a full-time keyboard player and work more on that with my arrangements. Um, and then Glutla and Eva said, but, but you know, you, now you're at the level where you, you need to continue singing. So on the album, you held all three actually is doing. Right. Eva will be the most, uh, the most of it. Um, a song like Homebound is pretty much only Eva singing okay. the, the clean vocals. Um, and, uh, but, but that also fired up a lot on, uh, under Glutla. He got very inspired. He he ha he's the kind of singer that really likes to work with uh, with the others uh, and, and sort of that's how he discovered Evil in the first place as a producer. Okay. Because he uh, while the rest of us were really comfortable just recording on our own in a sense in our own studios, he wanted to reach go outside of that and, and have a producer for his vocals. Right. Uh, so he started working with with Eva. So they know each other and then. Eva started, uh, you know, he has that frame of mind where it's not about me singing, you singing, it's like what's best for this part. Mm. So he really got Grutle back into the game of, of, of doing lots of, of very, uh, like new things, like you can hear on Uryutna, where he's, you know, 
letting his inspirations from everything from David Bowie to uh, Scott Walker shine through, you know. Uh, it's a really cool new side that they brought out. And then they brought in Hawkon and, and he does a lot of backup vocals. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, that's, that's an extra depth to it when, when this crazy society opens again and we can do live shows. I think people are going to have a good time just seeing like, oh, he's singing this part, amazing. And then it's the other guy, oh, it's the two of them singing and so on. So it's, it's really expanded. Right. And then what you mentioned with um, Gridland and kind of getting him, uh, challenging him himself again in, in terms of music. And, and I, I'm sure this is true for yourself as well. How important is that? Because I, I believe you've known each other. I think you were 14 or something when you first uh, uh, met him. And, and now you're on album 15. So how has that relationship and, and kind of trying to challenge each other uh, developed over the years? It was actually, it was, it was worse than that. It was 11, I think, the first time I met Gutl and started playing. We okay, played some death, death metal. Fair enough. Um, so it's always been that. It, it's based on two sort of, I think, fa- sort of uh, facts about our relationship that has been, uh, and still is a driving force. One is this uh, sort of constant exchange of, of music. That that's um, that's still ongoing, you know. Um, if whether it's birthday gifts or just I heard this also. Here's a copy of, of an album I bought. Mm-hmm. It's it's really awesome, and sort of challenging each other of on on things that we hadn't haven't heard before. And we've developed quite in separate directions in a sense. You know, he's he's very much a uh, on on the not conservative, but conservationist sort of side on music. He's very intrigued by the roots of, of things uh, and will explore, go backwards a lot of the time and, and sort of uh, very interested in early recording techniques and, and, yeah. and early albums. But I do, I'm really, I'm really in love with finding new things, yeah. uh, new genres or new expressions and things. And then we, at times still, they come upon these new things that we think, okay, th- He's, he was going to be interested in this, so this could be something for Gutler. And then we exchange that. So it's sort of uh, our main passion uh, in life is being music, yeah, collectors, uh, explorers, discoverers, and so on, uh, which is a lot of fun. And then the other thing is that we started the band sort of with ideas that was always ahead of us. Mm. So uh, in, in terms of being musicians, uh, we we had some, of course, experience on our instruments, but we started in slavery. We wanted to have a sound, but the sound was like way down the road. Like we mm. can't really play this yet. So the, re- the, it would, the rehearsals would be a lot about it coming up, you know, the next step on the ladder in, in terms of being able to pull it off. And that that's also become a really um, a stronger thing uh, over the years also with surrounding ourselves with these uh, geniuses mm. playing in, in the band like Hawk and Eva and and, uh, and Eisdale are, are like total heroes to us when, in terms of what they can do on their instruments. One thing is what they can do in Enslaved, but they have these technical abilities. And at the same time, they also have this love for sort of, I guess, what they refer to in, in soccer as like playing each other mm. better in a sense. Yeah. So you use your skills, and, and then sometimes you're at the front, and you can showcase. Yeah, back to to uh, flight uh, of thought and memory, and, and I'm wanting to have a part towards the end there where I just wanted them to really go from the the, the straight sort of line, uh, and sort of really go into that the image of the birds uh, flying playing in the air, so to speak. You know doing acrobatics around each other, sometimes in synchronicity and sometimes going off and, and, and describing that to them. And they'll be like, uh, okay, give us a few weeks. And then they come back with that like dual lead for keyboards and, and, uh, and lead guitar. It's just, uh, it's mind blowing. Okay. Well, that's, uh, and, and from what I've read, the studio was, it was a very fru- fruitful time as well. Right. Where, where you were just in the studio, just working on it. And, and um, no, so it sounds well, is, is that part of being used to kind of, obviously, album 15, you've been doing this for a long time. Does it, does it get easier in that sense where you kind of, uh, now you're surrounded with a lot of, well, you, you've always been surrounded by good musicians, but 
mm. kind of know what you want better and you not know how to get it um, more quickly in a sense yeah i think that's the, that's the only because it's such a um, uh, like composing and arranging music is such a intangible uh, mm. science in a sense you know we've I see you have a, a guitar in the back yeah. in the background, so you might. Uh, it, it is a possibility that you've been to a writer's workshop in, in your lifetime, and we've all been to those. And and the good ones are really the ones that's not too much about solutions. I would say, because you can't really put it up on a PowerPoint like how to write a good song. It's it's for me at least the, the times I'm inspired by other songwriters in where it's when they they have like a an inspiring narrative there's just something about it. it's not the actual sitting there and then you put your hand and you do diddle, diddle. that really never works you know it's it's fun for recreate recreating hits and so on if you want to see how it's built and all that but it's not really that's not what it's about i think becoming a better composer it's if you have to put an explanation to what that is it's narrowing the distance between the feeling you want to achieve, the idea, the vision, that's, you can't really describe it, narrowing mm. the distance between that and how the song comes out, in a sense. Um, well, you I, get I, closer and closer, I think. Right, and I, I've always find, found that a very interesting uh, thought, because I, I remember talking to, I think it was uh, Solstep here, the, the Icelandic uh, band, and we were talking about the kind of a similar thing. So, so which which song of yours do you think you've gotten closest to to what you had in my, on this record? Uh, uh, let's take this record. But which song do you think you've gotten closest to what you had in your mind? In the, in the sense? I think it was the uh, the ending song, okay. uh, "Distant Seasons." That was, um, it was such a monumental sort of. Tr- transition from uh, to uh, idea to what it became and, and how when when Eva added his, his vocals there and, and how it all came together in the studio it was just uh, and I remember still that uh, I think it's the first first time that um, th- that I cried uh, okay. during the recording process when Jens uh, when, when he was mixing it and I was waiting outside in the studio and he said yeah check out the mix and listen through it it was uh, it was not wasn't because it was sad or like a uh, wonder lot or anything it was just uh, this the like the experience of being in the middle of a process like that and remembering exactly what i felt when i started writing it and then months later listening to it and just being in awe of 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 what is possible in, in terms of, mm-hmm. of creating music as long as you have all these great people around you. Uh, so that was, that's a very powerful moment. And I think I it was a new, new one for Jens also. <laughs> he looked a little bit worried and then I said, no, 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 it's just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's just the pure uh, admiration for your work, man. It's happy. It's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> then it's good. Because the, are those the moments in, in a sense, because, um, well, the, the music business isn't the easiest business and uh, being a touring musician isn't, for everyone, I mean, it, it impedes on a lot of other parts of your life, I suppose. So, is are those moments kind of what the payoff is in a way? I would say so. Yeah, there's there's a lot of the thing is you just have to notice them. There's, this was obviously like a, a peak peak moment, the, mm. the one we just talked about. But it's it's all it's it's literally uh, littered with with these moments. As long as you just have the the, the presence to notice them it, uh, they're all over the place you know you have your re- reactions to the album it doesn't have to be like a 10 out of 10 thing on the, on the front page of the world's big, biggest magazine but it's, mm. it's like you, you run into people all the time that have a relationship to your music that's that's an inspiring thing you have the social aspect of being in a band when, when things work and, and you have like a good lines of communication, working with your, your label, management, booking, whatever, and, and just having, um, yeah, giving us, allowing yourself space and time to, to, to feel that, that you're all working to go towards a, a common goal, which, which I think is pretty much the closest thing to a uh, human experience of, of having a meaningful existence yeah. that we can come. It, it's not about, yeah, we get too focused on sort of the end goals in a sense. So if if 
if you all, if you all the time measure, if you have like your scale on the wall that says we are now the biggest band in the world or Metallica finally admitted that we're bigger than them. If that's sort of the thing, then you, I don't, I think you're going to miss out on that. Mm. And then you do a gig and, and somebody has a, a really big experience with the music there. And then, you know, it, it's, it's all over the place. Let's, let's try, I'm, I'm going to try and get into the concept a little bit, of the record a little bit more because I find it fascinating and, and my li uh, knowledge on, on Carl Jung and, and his teachings are, are very limited, so I'm going to try and please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, in this exploration of, like you say, the shadow self, but it's also uh, like an exploration of uh, mythical tales. Um, uh, have you found, what have you discovered about your own psyche by going through this process? Yeah, um, I guess you could say uh, quite a lot. Uh, if it's not entirely new territory, it's sort of a culmination of, of an ongoing fascination and process, and, and without becoming too individual in a sense and limiting people's experience uh, on their own, I would say that there has been uh, surprising times. I think you know. I think the biggest lesson uh, is that that going into such a process knowingly and and willfully, it sort of it initiates a process, but it continues. Mm. I think that's what I'm, my main thing to take away from it and, and, uh, is that, and that's I guess that's for for good and bad. It, it could serve as as a sort of a recommendation in a sense, but also a warning uh, that if, if that's not what you're prepared for, um, know thyself in a sense, uh, it, it can be, yeah, you have to be prepared for that. Um, sure. It's it, it really also I th has impressed me in the sense of, of Carl Jung, and I'm, I'm, I'm even more fascinated now. Um, mm when we worked this up in a, on a big scale, sort of um, how it affects you sort of on its own. It takes on a life on its own, this, this process. And it's mm -hmm. sort of, I guess that's all, another uh, term that was uh, coined and explored by you almost this synchronicity thing that you start seeing it a lot all over the place. You've, you've done a couple of uh, online shows because obviously the world being uh, the way it is, uh, yeah. travel is impossible. You've done that, you're finding new ways to explore these uh, uh, possibilities to, to present music to people. So how have you, you've done one for Roadburn and now there's two more uh, in wait. So, so what have you found about these new methods of, of connecting with people and, and getting your music out there? Yeah, it's exactly that. It's it's that's the motivation for why we, you know, uh, initially said yes to do one of these shows in in April, which was, which was a, a strike of of luck, because um, it was a very early online festival here in Bergen, and also mm -hmm. there's a very vibrant community here of of people working on that kind of technology already, um, young hungry people, which also happened to be into metal, yeah, so it's kind of like checked all the boxes okay. uh, and after that it was, the, the experience was was quite um, almost esoteric I would say like we started on this first show we we did five minutes and then we all had the same experience of, of going from sort of an alien weird sense of playing to an empty room and, and went to sort of it's not an empty room it, of course it is physically but it's the concept here and, and the reality of it is quite different because you got all these messages afterwards, people in in in, uh, in the mount, in the Rocky Mountains in the U.S. or on the coastline of India, South and India, people that we met throughout the years, so sending all these personal messages, and they, they all resonated in the same sense that the, it gave sort of a a uh, an hour of of what they perceived to be normal, you know, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what we felt. Also, it was a very weird and strange situation, but also had this extreme normality to it. So yeah, it's it's never going to replace the live show, but it's it's pretty damn close. And, and in these times, I would say it's the best thing that we could do with the new album and everything. It's it's we have a desire to present it to people, to communicate with people, uh, and and this has been 
been awesome. The, the Roadburn gig was fantastic, mm. especially getting all these photos from people in their living rooms <laughs> with uh, variations from a cup of tea alone or, you know, the, the, the family, uh, I guess, their, their, their friends that, they, that they're allowed to be with during Corona and sure. so on, and, and people having drinks, having fun. You see people with tiny screens and enormous hi-fi mm -hmm. speakers, or you see people with enormous televisions and a little laptop speaker next to it, all kinds of variations. But like the only thing I was that, missing but, was the mosh pit, but maybe <laughs> the next one. No, but like you say, it's just providing some, some uh, a sense of escape, just a moment of relief, and then a, a moment of kind of uh, a semblance of norm, normal. So that's yes, excellent. exactly. All right, Ivar, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you. I'm going to wish you a very uh, lovely day.